Okay, and what I'll, that's a good idea. Um, so I did post a, a couple of things there, a resource that Lewis Nelson sent um, about this really interesting training Campus Compact is doing. Um, uh, and about that, some of you asked, um, so I, U, UV does have an institutional membership, but Ellen is gonna help me figure out um, what the process is for, uh, if we just have to go in and register and it will automatically recognize us. Um, and also, I, I'll continue posting uh, the readings and questions ahead of time in there. Hope at least people look at them. Thank you, Lewis. No, I did. I, I was I actually did that so I didn't interrupt your uh, conversation. But I just wanted to no, say. My Thank you all so much for uh, this work. As you all know, I value this community engaged teaching. It's incredibly important. Kate's yeah. been doing fantastic work. Uh, sorry, Kate Stevenson, Kate Kostelik. We've we've not spent much time uh, uh, talking yet, but um, I'm really glad to see uh, Kale uh, join the conversation as well. Uh, oh, we yeah, have thanks. I'm excited to have sort of found this community. It's been um, a great morale booster for me just to sort of be connected with um, other folks in this working on community engaged teaching. Excellent, excellent. I also just wanted to offer just a quick shot in the arm. Um, as Kate Stevenson will know, we've got some money from uh, Jeff's Trust last year uh, to support a program uh, that she is working on. We've got another application in this year. And um, I'm actually talking in about two hours with a private donor who's interested also in making a contribution to support the work that you all are doing. So um, I'm out there beating the bushes, uh, trying to uh, make sure that you all have the support you need uh, to do this important work. And I just want to show up and say hi and thank you. And a special thank you also to Andy for being a bit of a, uh, a cheerleader for, for everyone on this. Thanks. Um, thank you, thank you. And, and you know what would be helpful um, if you or if Ellen wants to just write a brief description of any announcements about the grant application or anything that you may be aware of, I'll post that. Or we can just put Ellen actually can just post that right in Slack because there, there's about 32 people who have access to Slack. And as you can see, there's only about eight people online right now. Um, so that'll be sure whatever announcements you want to make, um, um, even a thank you, will go out to everyone. And, and they'll read it. Uh, we'll do that. Ellen, and I'll, uh, Ellen Blackman and I will put our heads together and come up with something for that. Absolutely. Yeah. Doesn't have to be. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you all so much. Sorry I can't stay, but just wanted to say, you know, go team. This stuff <laughs> matters. <laughs> Thanks, Lewis. Thanks. Sure Thanks, go. Coach. <laughs> Thanks, Coach. Um, all right, guys. So I, we're going to be a small group. Let's get started. Uh, and Kale, when we, when we get to your... Um, your portion, you know, you can decide if we still want to break ourselves. We probably do want to break into smaller groups. Uh, we could do two groups if it stays at this size. I don't know no. what you think. Okay. Also, I would love just your all's feedback because I haven't asked my students this yet. I My camera is on my laptop, but the laptop screen is so small, so I have a monitor, but my monitor is to the side. So is it distracting that I'm not, like, looking straight at the camera, but I'm sort of looking over the edge or does it not bother people not for me I, I think people are used to that yeah. yeah it's a whole skill set to learn to look right into the camera Kate taught me that actually I learned that from Kate I was like why is it you're making such good eye contact with me she said I'm looking at the camera well you're not talking to anyone you're talking to a camera that's an acting skill so thank you Kate um I need to get better at that so you guys let's just um Let's, let's dive in uh, to the first part of, what, um, of our discussion. I don't think we need to um, do any introductions. I think uh, everyone here knows e each other quite well. Uh, and Kate's been, in, Kate Costa has been involved too. So let's, um, let's dive in and let me just give you some context for why I selected this reading um, for today. One of the first things that I did in March when, uh, when everything uh, went to hell was to start to look at research on community-engaged teaching online to find out what people are doing, what the so-called best practices are. And I came across a body of research about what's called e-service learning. Um, I actually wasn't even aware of that term. Um, I've never liked the, the term service learning in general because of, of how it implies kind of a hierarchy between the people who are served and the haves and the have-nots, but that's a separate conversation. But the e-service learning, so there's, there's been a, a bit written about this, not as much as you would think. Um, and so what I thought would be interesting to do is to kind of 
Um, you know, our tendency, a lot of what we've talked about are the challenges and the obstacles of that, that an online environment pose for our particular kind of work, community-engaged teaching. But here a guy by the name of John Hammerley comes along and he writes this chapter in a book about called e-service learning. Um, and I will post in chat afterwards the link to the, the full book. Uh, he writes a chapter called Community Engagement and Technology for a More Relevant Higher Education. And he has a very interesting argument. He actually turns, turns the whole situation on his head and he says that, that folks, online environment is actually not an obstacle to be overcome if you're a community engaged teacher, but it is actually one of the best opportunities that we can leverage to do the work that, that we do even better. Um, and he kind, of, uh, he kind of frames that by suggesting that, um, that in order for education to be relevant in the 21st century, it needs to have certain qualities um, that are reflective of the way students learn and think and interact and create knowledge. Um, it needs to be connected, personal, creative, and open. Those are his four big words, and he goes into a little more depth in each one of those. It needs to be connected, personal, creative, and open. And then he goes on to say, well, well guess what? What we do as community-engaged teachers, what we value is precisely that kind of education that's connected, personal, creative, and open. Um, and it just so happens that, that those are the elements of information technology. That's how information technology works, how the whole environment in which students live and breathe right now, um, how it operates. It offers a way of interacting and creating knowledge, which is connected, personal, creative, and open. So these two are the perfect bedfellows, he says. You know, uh, So rather than apologizing for what we do, um, we should seize the moment um, and say, not only are we not uh, concerned about this online environment, but we are here to lead the, lead the charge in uh, showing people how the online environment can create, you know, powerful learning experiences, because that's what we do as community engaged teachers, and this and the virtual environment is is simply a tool. Um, so I just want to share with you briefly my own personal response to this, and then I want to open this up to a group discussion um, of of Hammerlink's ideas. Uh, and and the way I I think about this is. You know, historically, I've always, I like those terms connected, personal, creative, and open, because in many ways, the class, the, the, the main community engaged class that I teach, Books Behind Bars, has really tried to integrate those elements in different ways. Students learn literature, um, not by uh, reading alone only, but by connecting with others, uh, by forming relationships with others. Um, hearing perspectives of, of people that they might otherwise never have heard perspectives from. They do a lot of deep personal reflection about not only what, what they're thinking about the literature, but about the experience itself. They're developing creative ways to facilitate inclusive uh, and engaging conversations with the correctional center residents. So there's a lot of innovation in thinking about how do you ask an interesting question about literature that will, that will lead to a, an exciting conversation and not fall on deaf ears, um, creative activities, and then all of this is done in a spirit of openness and sharing, a love of conversation, a love of engaging with big questions. Um, and so in, in many ways, the framework that Hammerling provides um, seems to map well onto the work that I've been doing, or at least that I, I, I see is, is, um, that we're doing. Now, when you shift to the online environment um, uh, piece of the puzzle, um, I would agree with Hammerling that that teaching in an online environment has actually pro has provided some unique opportunities. I'll just give you a couple of examples. It's offered me the opportunity to reach new audiences. So this next semester, we're going to be able to offer uh, the class, not just to the, the, the residents within the facility, but also to their community placement uh, residents. The so ones who are already out in community placement programs in the community. So that's a great opportunity to connect with new audiences, the very kind of thing that Hammerlink is talking about. Um, also, we've had some you know, opportunities for new kinds of creative forms of sharing knowledge and creating knowledge. So students last semester created videos um, and were able to share um, you know, uh, uh, pictures, uh, kind of their living environment. So, 
so that their partners at the correctional center could see what their living space was like, even making it more personal. Um, they were able to share little clips from the internet about things, um, you know, the Italians singing from the balconies um, and things like that. And then another group of students used a video to create a social action project um, to raise awareness about the, the, the challenges of, of uh, COVID specifically in corrections audiences. And so these were all very creative uses of technology that in fact enhanced the class in some ways, gave us an opportunity to connect, to find more personal outlets, to be creative. Um, so all that's to the good. However, here's the however, here's the big but. Um, Hammer Lake is saying, so I could do an even better job of all of this if I was in an online environment. The results for all of us will be even better um, if we just focus our energies on leveraging information technology. I don't know. And I want you to help me figure that out by figuring this out together. So that's my little introductory kind of framing. And I'm, what I want to do now is I'm going to post into chat the quote quotation that um, um, I, I put in um, Slack a couple days ago. Why am I not seeing chat on my... I am the host and I'm not seeing the chat function. Yeah. Anyone it should be right any? on the bottom. Hmm. There we go, you have to open it. All right, can everyone see that? Yep. So take a minute and read that to yourselves if you would. So what I'm gonna do just um, for the heck of it, I'm gonna bring us into two breakout rooms. And I'd like us to think about this question. Do you agree with Hammerlink? Do you have examples from your teaching experiences that would support um, what he's arguing or challenge what he's arguing? Do we agree with him? What are some examples from your teaching experience that would support it or challenge it? Uh, and I personally am very curious what we come up with. So I'm gonna knock us all into a breakout room and we'll see you on the back end.
Welcome back, everyone. I hope I didn't interrupt you mid-sentence. Probably. Um, so I wanted to, the reason I want to bring us back is to have a little bit of kind of a debrief, but then launch into Kale's presentation, which is uh, very apropos of this conversation. Uh, so I want to leave plenty of time for that. Just curious, what um, any common themes come out of your discussion? General, general agreement, general disagreement, general on the fence. I think Alan and I seem to be on the same page in terms of acknowledging there are some inherent limitations with online learning. I mean, obviously there are some great opportunities, but you know, we both were talking about partner community partners who don't have internet at home, and so it makes it very hard to you know it's easy from this easier from let's say from students standpoint, but not so easy from connecting the students to community partners who may not have that. Um, that same level of access. How about from your group, you, Kate and Kate and Chu Chen? Uh, we were just talking about our, our different experiences. Kate, um, her students are out in the community. Um, they are volunteering for Cameron Webb's campaign. She's trying to bring them back to the theme of her class, which is food insecurity. And that's kind of, the food has fallen off the table. <laughs> that's kind of what's going on. M my class, I'm having my upper level students tutor my first years. Um, and the backgrounds of these students are, are just so different. Um, and, and ability, the literacy level of my upper level students is just different than my first years, you know. So um, we've been talking about, you know, um, rhetorical listening, understanding the cultural forces that affect the lives of others, you know, um, but they're just, I don't think they remember what it's like to be a first year. Um, and a lot of them don't know. And a lot of my first years are student athletes and they just don't know about the lives of student athletes. I talked a lot, sorry. By the way, that's the title of your article, Kate, the food has fallen off the table. <laughs> There's a lot, a lot of implications of that. Um, how about the online? How about Hammerlink's um, gung ho support of online um, teaching as the, the perfect, you know, a marriage with community engaged teaching? Did you guys come to any conclusions about that? We didn't really, um, we were sort of talking more about our classes, but I, I feel like um, he's right in some ways in terms of, you know, making things like guest speakers, stuff like that easier. But um, I disagree just in terms of the community within the classroom. I'm still really struggling with that. So um, I'm going to, you know, go back and, and look at that article again to see if he talks anything, if he talks about that at all, like like I see how you might connect to the community better um, in some ways, but I'm wondering how he gets the internal community through um, online learning. Does he talk about that, Andy? Uh, no, he doesn't. Um, he's, a, he's a real um, cheerleader for online learning. Um, no, he doesn't go into depth in that. His, his main point is we just need to tap into the student's reality. I, they're going to bring their cell phones with them anyway. He, he said they have this, this marvelous device, this, this information finding, creating, sharing, connecting device. They're carrying around with them all day long. We need to tap into that. So he doesn't even distinguish between in the classroom and out of the classroom. Um, it's almost like the entire world is the community, is, is, is his idea. Um, but yeah, I know it's a very fair challenge. And I also question, you know, when he talks about personal, you know, the example he gives our personal learning networks, PLNs, that we all have our personal learning networks that we connect with through, you know, various channels, social media and various other connected, you know, information technology um, channels. And, um, and that's how we get information. We don't do it in the old way where you just, you go and get a book out of the library. And, um, and so, and he gives the example of Wikipedia as a classic example of, of how knowledge is co-created by the community. Um, 
that's his emphasis in the personal discussion, but it really, but the question that just keeps going through my mind is how about the personal relationships? Right, personal learning networks is one thing, but you need, you know, a personal relationship. There's a lot of learning that comes out of that. I don't, I don't know how you can do that. I mean, I'm, I'm um, you know, I, one thing that that's, sort of, I don't know why this triggered this memory because it's not directly related to, um, to uh, internet learn based learning, but um, when Jim Ryan was at the law school, I was just, student here, he once commented that sort of, you know, his approach to um, to this traditional sort of Socratic method where you sort of ask student questions to sort of build to a point, which is popular in, in law school classrooms, he said he never asked a question that he wasn't personally curious about in terms of like, didn't know the answer himself. Um, you know, like, we've done this reading and I've thought about this and I really haven't figured out my own answer to it. And so I'm curious what you all think. And it's just requires a certain level of authenticity to how you're engaging with your students. And I think that's like, that's what you risk losing with too much, you know, the, the gimmick of online engagement can fail if you don't sort of keep centered that sort of authenticity that, that you're, that you're sincere in what you're putting out there and what you're connecting students to through. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Can you be authentic? How, how much can you bring a sense of authenticity, sincerity, um, curiosity maybe, authentic curiosity to an online environment? Does anyone have any thoughts about that? I'm curious. I mean, I, I have just really, you know, I think I, I definitely try to do that in my classrooms, ask questions that I don't know the answers to, because I definitely think that's where a lot of energy and discovery comes from. And those moments where um, you do feel like a connection with the whole class, like together as they actually learn something new or something gets generated, some kind of knowledge together. Um, and I'm really struggling on Zoom in to have whole group, what I call whole group discussions with all 18 students. I feel like we have some of those moments in the breakout sessions and they have regular groups. So that's created some community. They have their same groups of five. But the problem with that is I can't be in all the breakout rooms. So sometimes you need, you know, one of us um, to kind of facilitate, like get them to that moment. And so I feel like Sometimes I, you know, we have those moments in one breakout room, but then the other four breakout rooms weren't there for it. So yeah. that's my, been one of my major struggles this semester. I will say I do like the, the base exam feature that it puts people's names on the box. Cause like from day one, you're able to be like, I already know all my students' names because it's on their faces every time, you know, uh, they're on the screen. Um, so that sped things up. So you guys, I think we should transition to uh, Kale now, um, but I would encourage you, if you haven't read the article, it's well written. It's not written in an academies, so it's easy to read. It's short, um, and I think it'll stimulate some, some thinking about this. Uh, what it did for me is um, I, I intentionally chose it because it goes against what I believe, uh, and I wanted to see if he could convince me and get me all excited. Um, and he did while I was reading it. And then I went back to reality and I was no longer as excited. So, <laughs> um, but it is, it, it's, it's a big question for all of us. And I'm, I'm really thrilled that someone actually wrote directly on that and, and addressed it directly for our, our group. So Kale, you want to take it away? Sure. So what I thought I'd do is I had a, a couple of questions that are sort of really about how we do this sort of community engaged learning um, as our classes move online, classes that we initially designed and proposed to the university as in-person experiences. And now they've been kicked online. And so like how, you know, so questions around challenges related to that. And to sort of tee up those questions, I wanted to use one particular case uh, that I've been working on in the environmental law clinic 
uh, involving the Pine Grove School. So sort of a case study to help us get into the questions. So I'm gonna see if I can um, share my screen and launch this PowerPoint. Okay, it's working. Let's see here. I don't need sound, so there we go. All right, let me do from the beginning. All right. Boop. All right, so everyone can see this, I take it. I'm gonna move my camera out of my way. All right. So first, let me I just wanna, because the way things happen at law school, it's a little different than I think a lot of sort of main grounds teaching. Uh, clinical legal education, the basic idea, which builds off of, um, uh, you know, is experiential education is you take law students um, often in their third year, sometimes also in their second year uh, of law school and um, have them working under your supervision as a, as a lawyer with real clients on real cases, sometimes getting to argue the cases in court, sometimes uh, sort of working behind the scenes on, on drafting briefs. But the whole idea of clinical ed legal education is sort of almost like the sort of apprenticeship model where you're bringing students in to working with, um, with real world clients um, to meet their needs. And a challenge normally with clinical legal education is balancing student needs, you know, the pedagogical benefit that they get out of an experiential education class and the community service needs that you have a real client with real needs that's entitled to um, a full and fair, you know, uh, competent representation. Um, and of course, those challenges of sort of meeting the student needs, meeting the community needs get far more challenging as we move online. Um, so the case I wanted to tell you about is this starts here at this place in Cumberland County, Virginia, at the Pine Grove School, which was built uh, in 1917 uh, as part of the Rosenwald Schools Initiative uh, throughout the Southeast. Um, and I always, you know, as I've gotten into this, I decided I think that Rosenwald School's name is itself a bit of a misnomer because uh, Julius Rosenwald, uh, executive with uh, Sears Roba Company, shared the, the architectural designs for free with communities that wanted to build a school and gave them $50 seed money, at least $50 in this case. And that was it. Um, the rest, the land was donated by uh, Black families in, in the community in Cumberland County. Uh, the community raised $500 um, on their own to help uh, buy materials. Uh, and of course, the labor to build the school in 1917 was all uh, their own. So it's, it's really the Pine Grove School, not a Rosenwald School. Um, the school operated from 1917 until 1964 when the Civil Rights Act uh, finally uh, began to open public schools to all citizens. Um, and you can see here, you've got students um, on the left there. This is um, from the era when uh, Pine Grove was in operation. And then this, uh, a lot of the same students here on the right today, uh, right there in the middle in the plaid uh, pink and black plaid shirt is Muriel Branch, uh, Muriel Miller Branch, who's the president of the AMMD Pine Grove Project. That's our, our clinic partner. And what I've learned and what I think the students have learned in getting involved with this community is that preservation of this school building is not just about the four walls of the school. It's not just about this physical structure in Cumberland County, it's about uh, a broader community and a whole series of stories uh, that get told as you just spend time with that community. Um, the reason it's become a clinic case is because of this. Um, the, a, a company called uh, Green Ridge Recycling and Disposal uh, Company has proposed to build a, uh, a mega landfill uh, that would take in, um, I think it's 500 to 600 tons of trash per day um, on property that they own. The total size of the property is about 1,200 acres. The landfill disposal unit, which you can sort of see right here, sort of in the um, south uh, uh, west corner, is about 400 acres. And just to give you a sense of that, this 400 acre area is about the size of 300 football fields put together. So it's a massive, massive uh, facility. Um, and 
the Pine Grove School, as you can see, is really right there adjacent to it. In fact, this is Pine Grove Road, which normally would go right through the middle of what would be the landfill. Uh, the company wants to reroute the road, as you can see, around here to the side. And our job uh, with the clinic and with students and community members is representing, sorry, the community on um, all of the sort of the navigating sort of the environmental permitting processes and making sure their concerns are heard. And this is how that worked last year. So this is a picture of our students coming down, getting to meet with the former students of the Pine Grove School in the school building in Cumberland County, hearing their concerns, asking our questions. Um, and, you know, this really allowed us, you know, and they're not just meeting with the community members here, they're also getting the chance to meet with the regulators, um, you know, at the Army Corps of Engineers or Department of Environmental Quality or Department of Historic Resources. So we're getting a lot of these face-to-face -face meetings. Sometimes I'm going with the students, sometimes they're going on their own. And this presents sort of two challenges to us here. One is we're able to build community with our partner really easily this way. How do we do that online? Um, I'm also able to give students a lot of autonomy when they go down uh, on their own and really sort of are trusted to take uh, these cases as their own. Uh, now that all those meetings are on Zoom, it's very easy for me to just to pop in uh, electronically um, and join them for every Zoom meeting. And I sort of start wondering, am I, am I joining too many of these things? Should I encourage them to do it without me there so that they build those relationships? Um, so that's really been the challenge. Like this is exact, like the image you see here is exactly how um, I envision this clinic working. Um, this was from February, right before the pandemic hit. And, you know, we haven't, even though I'm meeting with some of my students in person this semester, I'm not, you know, our, our clients are sort of in higher risk category for severe complications from COVID. So we're not meeting with them in person. We're doing that entirely online. Um, so my break, let me switch to my breakout questions for us as we sort of think about this. And these are the questions I've been struggling with. So the first one here is, so how do you build community when your community engaged class moves online? How do I still give students this powerful experience? And I had students, you know, in this class in the past, say it was the most powerful class they had in law school because of the community engaged piece of it. How do we keep that powerful experience when the class moves online? Um, second question is, how much autonomy do I give students to build those relationships with community partners, knowing that it's so easy for me to be there via Zoom or via joining a conference call um, or just being CC'd on an email, but how much should I say, no, you do this without me? Um, so how do I, how much autonomy do I give students? And before we answer those questions, I have my third bonus question. Um, so clear the, clear the slate here. And the bonus question was inspired by um, a conversation, an email back and forth I had with our client, um, Muriel Miller Branch, who's the president of the project to preserve the school. AMMD, by the way, if you're wondering, stands for the AG, uh, Miller, Mayo, Dungy family. So those are the four black families, all of whom had uh, uh, kids who went to this school and have pulled their resources to try to serve it, to save it rather. Um, so, and what she said to me as we were having this long back and forth about the case once, I had e ended uh, my email. She had corrected me on something I had gotten wrong. And I said, oh, I'm sorry about that. I'll, I pledged to keep listening. And she responded, with this email, she wrote me back. She said, the most powerful words spoken in this entire email thread are, I pledge to keep listening. That's all my community has ever asked to be heard. We don't mind doing the work, but when our two centuries of hard work is overshadowed or devalued, it is incumbent upon me to correct the record. Thank you for giving my community that platform. To me, that's entirely what this community engaged learning is all about. And as we move online, my question is, how do we keep listening like this when our community engaged classes move online? So I've got, I'm gonna end the, the share here. And I've got these three questions. Um, 
typed out. I'll move them into the chat now. Oops. And right. Kill, do you want me? I have the old, I can just reshuffle the breakout rooms and recreate them. Um, or do you sure, want Sure, that works. So here are the questions. Did that get them all up here? I can't see. Huh. Boom. All right. It didn't quite go as smoothly as I'd hoped, but there they are, the questions. All right, so should we do breakout rooms again and take a look at those three questions? Sure, I'll, sh I'll recreate them. Great. I'm not, uh, yeah.
so Ellen, obviously when we are doing these online international meetings, I don't ever join because there's too many of them <laughs> to join. But when it's local, I go. <laughs> so I'd love to hear, I uh, love the, the uh, group of Kate, Kate and Kale to share what conclusions you came to. So we, the, the two Kates gave me some great ideas on what I could do with the Pine Grove case, you know, in terms of collecting community stories, um, maybe reaching out to Stephen Parks about getting students involved to collect those stories and publish those stories. Um, Kate, you mentioned uh, maybe a Thrive grant or, you know, there's just so many ideas about a way to especially if the case, um, the project continues for a while. And I expect the environmental permitting will take a long time. So I expect it to be a multi-year project. It's already, it started last spring for me, um, or last December really. Um, and I imagine it'll continue for at least another year, maybe more. So just sort of ways to sort of build some, um, you know, use resources to help tell more of the community stories. And do you think that would help um, achieve the, the, the goal of, of building the community question that you asked? Is that another way to build community? Yeah, I mean, it would certainly, if, if folks are, you know, if you think of a Zoom call where it's very easy to say, all right, well, Today's meeting is, you know, we, we had a Zoom conference with the community and our students. There's a permitting, um, a, a comment period that actually expires on October 21st um, with the Army Corps of Engineers related to a water and wetlands permit. Um, so we had a community forum with folks to sort of talk to them about sort of the issues that the Army Corps of Engineers is gonna look at, what they might say in their comments that is relevant to those questions. Um, but all of that is fairly dispassionate. It's, you know, you're not really, you know, the students are physically seeing their community partners on the screen and they're connecting, but they're not, um, they're not really getting to know them. And if, if recording their stories would obviously, even if it remained entirely online, would create a much more intimate relationship between the community partner and the students. It also strikes me that's a, that gets at the listening question. Right? Yeah. Letting people listen to their stories. That's, that's so, you know. I, that yep. was um, one of the most amazing, I mean, this never would have happened, I think, online. But when we went down there, that picture I have when we're all sitting around that big table um, in, from February, and this, the former students just started chit-chatting, sharing stories. And one of them was talking about how they had this, you know, four mile walk up the road to the school, you know, down this sort of rural Pine Grove Road. And they would, you know, she'd pass her friend and she said, do you remember the call that I used to use to get you to come down the, you know, to the road to walk with me? And they sort of, then both sort of shared this sort of, um, you know, sort of bird sound like call that she would make from the road, this sort of holler that she used to say, I'm here, it's time to go to school. Um, and just that little nugget is not something we, I we would have gotten this year entirely online. Um, it just had, it just came from just sort of being in the room and not saying anything, just letting the conversation flow. What did, what, um, Andy, what did your group talk about? Well, whether what I, I'm, well, we can show that in a second, but what other ideas came out? Those, this is really interesting and really helpful. Kate and Kate, what other insights came out of your discussion that stand out for you? Well, I feel like, you know, like Kale said, we kind of went rogue and we, we didn't actually <laughs> talk about the, the questions we were supposed to, but I think that that question of autonomy was really interesting to me. I mean, I think that's a struggle I always have in the classroom, like how much do I step back and how much do I, um, you know, step forward, I guess. And I thought that, you know, I've done some storytelling projects in the past. Um, some of my students 
did a um, sort of interview slash survey project with Loaves and Fishes that helped um, Jane Mills, who's the director there, um, sort of um, streamline their, their um, procedures and really sort of get some feedback from clients. So I think um, in doing that, like you prepare the students, but it also allows for a lot of autonomy because presumably, you know, you're not going to be there for each of of these interviews, you know, maybe you have one one student or two students do them, but I think like there's a lot of preparation where you're involved, but then that actually would give them a lot of autonomy and it would be interesting because they would sort of form relationships that you don't have to, because I think sometimes that's the problem. Like we're we're like always the primary, like if you get on that Zoom call, like everyone's focused on you, you know, mm -hmm. or if you're at that interview, everyone's going to be focused on you, Kale, you know, like like, I think it could be a really interesting way to, to let the students listen, like you're saying, but also, like, give them leadership autonomy. It could be, I don't know, now I'm thinking maybe it's your students that have to collect the stories, even though Kate and I would like to have our students do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, and I think of, of building the community in the classroom, and I think that giving the students, whether they're, they're Cal students or our students in the writing and rhetoric program, you know, this very important task and being entrusted with these stories, getting away from the pseudo transactional nature of a lot of writing projects that are just between the teacher and the student, mm -hmm. you know, um, understanding the importance of this work and, and doing justice to the stories, I, I think would just really unite the community, you know, um, of students um, and just give them a larger, more a, a purpose, you know. And I, I love this distinction, a couple of you have mentioned this, the distinction between transaction, you know, the transactional nature. You mentioned writing, Kate, but I, I would argue that, that Zoom, that, that so much of the, the Zoom stuff is, is transactional. How do, we, how do we go from transactional to transformational? How do we, in an online environment, so just using your story example, how do you do that? How would you do that in an online environment so that it, it really fulfills that? that goal of giving the students the sense of, of importance and, and urgency of what they're doing and allows them to build those connections and deeper connections with the community. What, what does that look like in, in our current environment? This is a cheater answer to it, but one thought that occurs to me that if we're not doing like a community forum where we're talking about an environmental permit that's at stake, but we're just collecting one person's story. It's a little, we could sort of do that in person safely. You know, we, I could say, okay, so you're one student or two students, drive down to Cumberland, sit outside, wear masks, stay, you know, 10 feet apart and let one student tell her story. Um, that's easier to sort of maintain masks, social distancing in, everything else outside. If we're talking like, you know, you saw in that picture to the, to a broader community, it's, you can't really do that as easily. So maybe this is a way to get some of my in-person experience back. I love it. I love the idea. I, and I'm also incredibly envious because there's no way that would work with correctional center residents. <laughs> They're not allowed outside. Literally, I mean, this it's they they're allowed outside for their you know outside time, but not they they only started letting volunteers in. So I'm I'm learning from you guys. <laughs> I'm also learning what a lot a, a big hill I have to climb. Ellen, you had some interesting thoughts about autonomy, uh, how much autonomy to give students. Uh, yeah, I mean, just listening to you guys on your report outs, you've added a lot of depth to it. So I don't know if my, my initial thoughts are, are all that insightful, but uh, I was just sort of noting how um, in working with faculty across the university, um, you know, you all choose different levels of autonomy to give to your students that, are, that depend very much on um, who the community partner is, um, how sensitive this population may be that you're working with, um, sort of the investment in the relationship, if it's a really long-term one, if it's one that's really faculty founded, um, mm -hmm. then I've noticed that the faculty members tend to keep students on a, on a shorter leash there. Um, because, you know, sometimes students just haven't quite 
gotten the hang of um, how they themselves can be respectful in, commu in communications. I know that's, that's, that sounds terrible coming out, but um, just that, you know, they, 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 you know, could use a guiding hand sometimes. Um, so yeah, um, it's, it's not applicable across the board, this kind of short leash, um, you know, uh, mentality. Um, but yeah, it just seems to be like, it's a case by case kind of thing, um, you know. I think that is definitely true, like that, um, you know, I'm sure we've all had this experience. You just have a student, you know, I can think of one last semester, last year who maybe it's because she was older. She had sort of been, she took some time off of between law school and between college and law school. So I had a maturity that other students might not have had where I was just like, wow, like she's built this relationship. She gets it. And I'm not even worried at all about that. I'm not there for these meetings and other students who may, may not have that maturity to where you, you want to keep them on a shorter leash because you're worried about them, up, you know, offending your partner. Uh, another thing that I that I, I noticed um, with a class that took place, I think last the last fall semester, um, was that the students were sort of asked to go out and build the relationships themselves, and um, they had imbibed just enough about community engagement best practices to get really cold feet about it. And, you know, they, mm. they were really worried that, you know, I don't, you know, I don't want to offend anyone. And when I write these emails, I really want to make sure that, you know, I am keeping within the lines. And so, you know, that's, that's another, that's the flip side, right? Where students get sort of um, a little timid about it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you just have to figure out how to play it. <laughs> and I think that's where like um, this would have to, I mean, it would have to be almost its own course because you can't just send them out and you have to spend a lot of time, um, you know, looking at the questions they're gonna ask together and thinking about how you're gonna listen and interview and like, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, a, short, there's a short leash in the background, but then like, mm -hmm. hopefully if it's done well, there's also like a lot of autonomy um, when they actually, get to the point of doing the project, which is probably half, halfway, at least halfway through the semester. Because the way I would envision it is you've got one class, one semester sort of doing the story collecting. And then the second semester is the publishing. Like you couldn't get all this in, I don't think. I think you would also probably need to, I mean, I could see a two semester course where you do um, readings on ethical community engagement, like Kate and I did um, in Steve Parks, or Kate and Steve Parks and Tamika Carey's um, engaged learning seminar this summer. Um, but yeah, you would have to do that as well as, you know, looking at other suppressed narratives, interviewing skills. Um, yeah, so it would be a literature and community engagement and writing. Shu Chen, we haven't heard from you. What, what, um... You had some interesting things to say in our breakout. Um, I would say first, most important suggestion will be if uh, the engagement is outside of class time, uh, trade them, uh, cancel class time so that they don't feel deprived of their own time. I found the, a big difference between when we didn't do that and when we did that. Uh, they felt much better when we were able to trade time with them and second of all so long as we we do we we do communicate what um so we we have second year and third year classes we do it in different formats when it's international community we have a, a set of prompts that they have to work out they get information from their beijing uh, or taipei uh, tutors and the tutors are often pre-service teachers teaching Chinese as a foreign language uh, majors. Um, so we do have a set of prompts for them to ask them, for them to, and my students will come back to report back. Um, but for the local engagement, we work out the, uh, we co-create in the classroom, uh, work out the, the questions, and then I take them to the community members, uh, Chinese uh, immigrant community members and then we work out stuff and then they come back to report on what they gain. 
And we also offer uh, Chinese community members information about applying to UVA because they ha they often have children who who might be first generation college students. So so we we international ones and local ones are different. So uh, Shuchen, I have a question. We, we, task, I'm sorry. When they have to report back, then we we make sure they they really get something done. Yes. When you say you take your students to the community, what does that mean in this environment? I meet, we meet them. What? We meet with them. Outside? Yeah, outside of UVA. Oh, okay. We, we take them to maybe a restaurant or to a public space, and then we interview them. And students come back, they transcribe the uh, interview. They, when they transcribe, because it's a language class, when they transcribe, they feel they learn so much. Mm -hmm. And so if you're holding students accountable for remembering and knowing what they got from the community member, uh, of course, it needs to, you need to have a good set of questions. That is, you set up the task ahead of time. And when you, rep when they have to report back, then uh, for sure, it, it, and then even if it's online, when they have to report back what, on what they got, they learn something. So maybe similarly with the with Kale's case, uh, in which so long as you give them a task for the, to to accomplish, and then when they report back, you can tell if they are if they have uh, done something. And that gets at the issue of of autonomy. I mean, if you provide uh, students with sufficient guidance and context and structure. And then you need to let go. I mean, you, so mm -hmm. we need to figure out what that is, what the necessary guidance and structure and, and container is. But beyond that, uh, you don't meddle. Otherwise, it, you need to give them autonomy. So like with, you know, in Books Behind Bars, a big part of our, you know, initial four weeks is thinking about and practicing asking questions, interesting questions, like, like Jim Ryan said, the questions that you yourself don't have an answer to and students learn um, the difference between a good question and a bad question, then creative activities that might bring out some themes of, of a story, um, how to listen well. We always do a, have Dorte Bach comes in and does a workshop on listening. It'll be really interesting to have her do it this year on listening online. So students, but students are given kind of this, this you know, and then some insights and we talk about the literature, but beyond that, they are responsible for the hour and a half meeting, at least that's what we did in the physical facility. They are responsible for facilitating that meeting and generating, um, you know, and then and really handing over power, as much power as the residents are willing to take so that it really is a, a community of equals. But um, I don't get, if, if I were to jump on those meetings online, it would be, um, with the students and their resident partners, it would be a disaster. It would totally taint the the the, the spirit of it. Um, yeah. And then you just have this extra. I mean, this isn't that big of a deal, but you have this extra piece that you have to prepare students for. Hopefully, that they're savvy enough to know on their own. But just little things like that if you're engaging with a community partner through Zoom that you need to keep your camera on so they can see you. You need to make sure your background is not distracting. You need to not, you need to resist the urge if you feel like your partner is droning on about something to tab over to something else on your computer screen, you know, just, just to stay totally in the meeting. Um, so there's just a whole level of additional student training that's required to make sure that like that you're engaging with the community partner in a way that's respectful and what is that that's means something slightly different when it's a zoom meeting as opposed to an in-person meeting so guys i want to be respectful of your time um <laughs> I, um I'll tell you a little bit about what we're going to do next time i would ask you to do me one favor would you just write into chat um, one kind of main takeaway and uh, one uh, question that you still have that came out of today's discussion, because uh, I'm going to try to, you know, hopefully we maybe we can talk about the what one takeaway 
And what's the one thing that you're taking away from today's conversation? And what's one question that remains that you still are grappling with? And uh, chat that to everyone, not just to me. What was the other piece, the takeaway, and then one other thing? A question, something you're not, maybe a new question that came up for you as a result of today's, uh, or a new challenge, or just something you're still grappling with that came out of today's discussion. Good. We'll post these in Slack too. Huh. So, um, thank you guys. I, I, uh, even though we had a small group, I thought it was a really rich discussion. And I want to thank Kale um, for sharing. That was a great case study. Um, and for the questions that you asked that got us all thinking. Um, so thank you, Kale. Really appreciate it. Thank that. you all very much for, for hearing me out on it. It's yeah, fun to get to share. We'll hear, hear more from you and others as well. Um, so next time, Brian Williams is slated to be our guest presenter. I don't know what he's going to present about. Um, and I don't know what the reading will be yet either. Um, so we'll figure, I'm going to talk to Brian and see what he's, what he wants to do. And then maybe we'll try to find a reading related to that. Um, if any of you have any, uh, come across any articles like in Chronicle of Higher Education about these issues, about the challenges of online teaching and how it relates to our, you know, community engaged teaching, please share those with me and with the, with the whole group in Slack. Um, and hell, we may even use one of those articles. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna to try to figure out ways we can create more engagement in our um, Slack. And I don't know if it's a matter of me also sharing that there's a reading available uh, through an email or if any of you have any other ideas, if you do, please share those with me. Um, or it just could be that we're just also tired and we just like the community once every month. So that's good enough too. I wish I could offer you milk and cookies along with it, but. <laughs> Um, thank you guys. Thanks, Sammy. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Take Bye. care, everyone. Bye.